Professor Margaret Hogan Ellis is here uh, with us. Uh, she's going to talk about paper title in the future. She's a, 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 a specialist in paper conservation, and currently she is the Eugene Thong Professor of Paper Conservation at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. And also, she served as director of Thong um, Conservation Center at the Morgan Library and Museum. Um, she's also vice president and fellow of the American Institute for Conservation of Historical and Artistic Works, and fellow of the International Institute for Conservation um, of Historic and Artistic Works. Um, and also, she is a um, accredited conservator and restorer of the International Institute of Conservation. And uh, she has won many professional and academic awards, uh, such as Caroline and Sheldon Keck Awards, um, in recognition of her sustained record um, of excellence in, in, the in the education and training of conservation professionals. And also she won a uh, Luther Ward John Gittens Mary Award in recognition of her outstanding service um, to the American Institute for Conservation um, of Historical and Artistic Works. Um, she also won the Roman Prize in, 1990, um, in, in 2014 and she, she was the first conservator to be awarded with this award. Um, and, uh, she just came back from her scholarly residence at Getty Institute, uh, Getty Conservation Institute. Um, she has published um, a wide range of articles and lectures, um, <coughs> and talk about artists from Raphael Tichon to Paula um, to Lichtenstein. Um, and um, her research on artist materials um, also uh, wide ranging. Her most recent publication is the historical perspectives in the conservation of works of art. Um, published by Getty Conservation Institute. Um, uh, she, um, she also published numerous articles in academic journals and books. Um, today, we are very honored to have her here to talk about um, paper with us. This is welcome, Professor um, Ellis. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, good, good, good afternoon, officially. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, and thank you, Laura, for making the uh, arrangements for me to come here. Um, and today, as is obvious from around the table, and those of you who are sitting in, around the edges, you should make, avail yourselves a little later on of the assortment of papers that I've, I've put out uh, for our um, uh, increased familiarity and connoisseurship, if you will. Um, I think you'll all agree that um, most of us spend considerable time looking at and interpreting written, printed, and drawn marks on paper. We mentally untangle these marks that are on the paper, but what about the paper on which the marks appear? Surely, paper is part of the picture. But just like we can decipher or read the marks, we can also read the paper. And reading paper will increase its meaning. And, I will posit, it involves many more human senses than just eyesight. But, let's review what we know about paper from what we have read in the literature of art. For example, catalogs of shows of drawings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, or even in your own galleries. What do we read about the paper on which the marks appear? So, if we reach for one of your catalogs, sometimes we're told the paper's color. For example, ivory, cream, or buff. Or, occasionally, we're told that it's a laid paper or a wove paper. And sometimes, paper is described by its function. For example, it's a butcher paper or a plate paper. Most often, however, no mention of the paper is made at all, as if the marks on it are suspended in air without any physical matrix whatsoever. I find it strange that few truly evocative and informative descriptions of paper are found in the literature of art. Not only are observations about the paper uh, substrates of prints and drawings rarely mentioned, there exists a curious lack of language to describe the paper. 
Many of the terms used, such as those that you see up here, are vague, misleading, or outdated. Even if we're given this information, ivory cream buff laid wove with your paper plate paper, what does it tell us? What do we see in our mind's eye about that paper? If I say that a drawing is on a buff wove butcher paper, do you automatically envision that paper and do you recognize that the artist intentionally selected that particular paper for a reason? Do we automatically appreciate that that paper has very specific physical and visual properties? Or if we, if we hear that uh, it's on a white absorbent plate paper, do we immediately say, okay, that was supposed to be run through a printing press. It must be non-absorbent. It must be very durable. It must be very soft. Most people probably don't. When we read buff wove butcher paper, do we see in our mind's eye a watercolor color by Ian Chile, who was, according to legend, so impoverished that he resorted to using butcher paper, even though we know that's not true. <laughs> uh, when we read white plate paper, can we feel the softness and see the bright whiteness that accentuates the crisp engraved lines of William Hogarth? Paper has the physical power to preserve marks on its surface. And for this reason, paper has been named as one of civilization's most important inventions ever. Daydreaming scholars in the Library of Congress lift up their eyes to read in the rotunda litera scripta manet, the written word indoors. Paper has the physical power to preserve on its surface marks. But paper has a second, and many will argue, a more significant metaphysical power. It transmits the meaning of the marks from hand to hand and from generation to generation. So given this extraordinary physical and meta metaphysical roles, metaphysical and physical roles, how can it be that paper goes so unnoticed? In my opinion, paper is overlooked and underdescribed for two main reasons. Firstly, we are far removed from paper today. Paper is no longer an integral part of our daily lives as it once was. Many of the papers that were used in the past no longer exist since technologies change. And secondly, the properties of paper are and always have been difficult to consistently qualify and quantify, even for those who know it best, even for those whose business is buying and selling or using paper. Ironically, when it comes to describing paper, sometimes it's easier to describe what it's not. To wit, la folle blanche. In truth, a blank sheet declares by the void that there is nothing as beautiful as that which does not exist. It's interesting to note that une folle blanche has the same meaning as a blank slate, in the sense that it conveys hope for redemption and a fresh start or a new start. So let's accept the promise and the challenge of La Voix Blanche and make a fresh start by recognizing that paper is indeed part of the picture. And let's get to know paper a little bit better. To reiterate, today we're removed from paper. Paper is no longer a part of our daily lives. It's a fact that many of the papers used in the past no longer exist due to steady march of technology. It wasn't that long ago that paper had many, many more functions. Each end use required specific visual and physical properties such as color, thickness, texture, and absorbency. Paper served to wrap white sugar, and explosive gunpowder. It transferred decals, it was twirled into drinking straws and music rolls for player pianos and cut into dress patterns. 
If a paper is called by its functional name, and here we see carbon, or as it was originally called, carbonic paper, everyone immediately recognized its intended end use and knew exactly what its associated properties were. Okay, you all have a little packet in front of you. I want you to start with the yellow pages. Everyone in America knows that the yellow pages have a distinctive color, thickness, sound, even smell. Smell. Smell those yellow pages. Okay, they smell like yellow pages. But will the next generation be able to recall those sensations? When you see a work of art, artists have used the yellow pages. Are you going to be able to identify what that paper is and what its physical characteristics are and how they add to the meaning of the work of art? Likewise, our generation knows that newsprint, next piece of paper, newsprint is thin, it's smooth, feel, touch, touch, feel, it's lightweight and it's as short-lived as yesterday's news. As newsprint deteriorates, as anyone can attest, it was left out in the sun, it becomes dark and brittle. We know from sight and we know from smell what age wood pulp um, paper smells like. And that brings me to the next one, which will probably even fall out. <laughs> Chocolate, feel, smell. What's it smell like? Smells like old paper. That's because it has lignin in it. Lignin is a component of unrefined wood pulp. It degrades into a derivative of vanilla. You should smell vanilla. It's that old book smell. In fact, I have here paper passion. Perfume. Smells like old books. <laughs> Help yourself. <laughs> okay? Smell, touch, sight, hearing. You have to get to know paper a lot better. Because many artists, including Picasso and de Kooning, have used newspaper, it's important that we be sensitive to its materiality and, by extension, its meaning. Just like our generation intuits the look, the sound, and the feel of yellow pages in newsprint, so did consumers in the past. If they saw this, which is a Rembrandt etching, they would recognize that the paper held here by Liebens von Kappenau, who was a 17th century writing instructor, a penmanship teacher, they would immediately recognize that that's a tool of his trade. It was non-absorbent, smooth, and satiny due to the way the paper was sized. Papers intended for writing were tub-sized. That is, they were dipped into a dilute solution of gelatin after the manufacture. This thin external skin of gelatin meant that the ink from a pen would remain crisp and not feather and bleed out into the surrounding paper. Because of this finishing pro process, the paper had a distinct sound when it was shaken. This is a characteristic called a rattle. You should have a piece of writing paper right here. And if you hold it up to the light, you'll see that it, this is old writing paper. This is probably this is by 18th century, I guess. But feel it, feel it, rattle it. Do you hear the rattle? It has a rattle. It has a rattle because it's been gelatin sized. The reason it's been gelatin sized is so that the writing doesn't bleed all over the place. Okay? And it's kind of slightly satiny touch, kind of smooth. This slicker surface reduced friction on the quill pen that you see here, or the metal nib of a, of a pen. And thereby, it has a very practical benefit. As noted by many teachers of penmanship, 
the writer accomplishes more work and his hand is less tired because it reduces the friction. Okay. Paper that's not sized at all, called waterloo paper, also found a home on a writer's desk, but is blotting paper, seen here on a rocker on the left, and it was used to hasten the drawing of ink and to prevent it from transferring. And the next little square of paper in your pack is blotting paper. Notice the difference not only in the way the blotting paper, unsized paper, feels, but also the way it sounds. No rattle, then rattle. Its physical properties are exactly the opposite of writing paper. So today, a paper's resistance to a writing ink, a pen nib, is of little consequence. Preference is given to extreme whiteness and the ease with which the paper will glide through high speed laser printers. The distinction between papers for printmaking and printing and those for writing have drastically narrowed. And this perhaps reflects the demise of writing. In the tiny market of artist papers, maximum versatility is the number one consumer requirement. And here, if you look at your next little square, you see a very smooth, exceedingly white, non-absorbent marker paper. Okay? The paper is made specifically for felted pens because the ink used in felted pens is transparent. This paper contains something called optical brighteners. Optical brighteners absorb visible light and reflect back more of it. In other words, it's like the Tide slogan, whiter than white. <laughs> tide contains optical brighteners. That's why your clothes look whiter than white. This paper contains optical brighteners. So the light passes through the transparent marker ink, hits the paper, and bounces back to your eyes and makes those marker pens look really brilliant and saturated. So that's, that's made specifically for marker pens. If we go back, conversely, the properties of paper for printing, again, we're going to go back to Mr. <coughs> Coppenhall, we're going to go back to the Rembrandt etching. Um, here we see the writing master with the tools of his trade, but the paper used to print this picture has to be completely different from the properties of the paper that you see depicted in that um, etching. Etching paper is soft and fuzzy in order to reproduce and grab the ink out of those fine lines of a copper plate. It's less heavily sized than writing paper and has a very muffled rattle. So the next little piece of paper is a printing paper. Just make sure you go in the right direction here. It's right after, it's kind of a cream colored paper. Feel how soft and fuzzy it is. Feel how, feel how different it is. And the, and the rattle, the kind of muffled rattle, it doesn't have that crispness, crispness that the gelatin sized paper has, right? So, um, in his quest to produce, and we're looking at one of the greatest printmakers in the world, in his quest to produce velvety impressions, the experimental etcher Rembrandt also used newly imported Japanese papers. Um, he used paper made from gompi fiber, and that is especially soft and absorbent paper. So your next little sheet is Japanese paper, although it is not gompi. This is a kozo paper. But you can feel the difference. You can feel how soft this is. One side is softer than the other side. And he used the soft side. But he, he used a different, different fiber. Um, in these newly imported papers. And they made his, his etchings dark and, and very, very, very rich. He also, just for your information, um, printed his etchings on parchment as well. Inigo Jones, picture here, 
would have selected a paper for his architectural drawings that was durable and that could withstand rough handling. And what you see in the picture that he holds, in the paper that he holds in his hands, you can tell the sharp creases and the folds in that paper provide clues about its thickness and its stiffness. And so if you were a 17th century viewer of this print, you could immediately identify it and feel the paper's heavy weight and substance, and you probably could even imagine it it's rather. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, artists were attuned to both the visual and the physical properties of paper. Before the second half of the 18th century, all paper was made by hand and had an internal pattern known as lathe. And this is formed as a result of the regularly spaced chain and lathe lines that make up the porous sieve of the paper making mold. And I don't know if everyone knows what a paper making mold is, so I brought one. This is a paper making mold. This is the mold on which paper is made. Okay, this is the Western paper making mold. This is the deco, and this is the mold. And you can see that the pattern of the paper that is formed is a direct result of the pattern and the structure of the mold. Okay. So, does everybody know how paper is made, basically? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know we dip it into pulp, we lift it up, we take off the deco, we cooch it. Okay. All right, so all, most of the papers that I've brought here are antique leg papers, so I would encourage you all to pick one up. Those of you in the back, reach over and pick up a piece of paper and hold it up to the light. And you should all see, I think most of them are laid, and you should all be able to see laid lines and chain lines. And you should, in most instances, be able to see a watermark. Okay. Does everyone have a watermark? No. No? Okay, we have all sorts of watermarks. I have a G on the Okay, so after 1750, a new smooth, smooth uh, surface, not smooth surface, I should say smooth structured uh, paper uh, appeared that called, was called roll. And that's the paper that you see on the, the right up there. And that evened out that, that coarse uh, structure of, of, of the paper baking mold. Artists were desperate to get their hands on this new smooth surface paper, which did not have the hills and the valleys of blade paper, topographic features that interfered with both dry and wet line media. Witness the enthusiastic reception of wove paper among watercolorists in 18th century England. Excerpts from a letter of Thomas Gainsborough should suffice. He wrote, I should take it as a particular favor if you could send me a half a dozen choir of the new paper, it being what I have long been in search for, for making washed watercolor drawings upon. There is so little impression of the wires, and those so very fine, the surface is like vellum. End quote. Two weeks later, after receiving the wrong paper, Gainsborough lamented, I could cry my eyes out to see those furrows. <laughs> <laughs> Consider the difference, and I want to show you, I'm going to pass around, this is a picture, or this is, a sheet of J. Watman Turkey Mill. This is the first, among the first, uh, it has a date of 1830 on it. This is among the first handmade wall papers. So when this goes around, compare it with the antique laid papers that you have, and you'll see that it was quite a revolutionary change. Okay. So consider the difference between what uh, a medium looks like on a uh, laid paper as opposed to the wall paper that you saw. This is a game for a watercolor on a wall, uh, laid paper. And the dimension, the disruptions of the media caused by the striations of the laid and chain lines can be clearly seen 
uh, as circled in red. Across the channel, the French artist, Jean-Auguste Auguste Dominique Ang, was thwarted in his efforts to obtain English wove paper due to a trade embargo imposed during the Napoleonic Wars. Ang must have had some sources, however, since this portrait of Lucien Bonaparte and his family would appear to be on contraband English paper, uh, wove paper, which shows off the artist's delicate photo, photo realist graphite lines to their best advantage. A little later, the American artist, James McNeil Whistler, living in London, actively sought out paper from Paris with exactly the opposite properties, relishing its rough texture that would enliven his dry chalk lines. Writing to his printer, he said, Enclosed, I'm sending you a sample of the brown paper. Here's some brown paper in your sample here. Yeah. Brown paper. With which you wrapped the etchings when you sent them to me. Well, so you have some of this paper, or you know at least where you bought it. Now it's just the paper I need for my drawings. I am always looking for some. But although all the shops have brown paper, it's rare to find any with this fine grain paper. So be good enough to buy a packet of it for me at once at the tobacconist, where you acquire this one. And this is so-called craft paper. Kraft, for those of you who speak German, means strong. It's not for crafts. It's strong. And you can feel it's strong. It's very strong. You can also tell the grade. One way it's going to tear easily, and the other way it's going to tear with great difficulty. It's known for its strength and craft. So just like we can see, and we can hear, and we can feel the properties of paper when it's part of the picture, or the picture itself, so can we conjure up its characteristics when we read about paper in historic literature. In other words, paper is part of the story, too. Paper played a critical role in Jane Austen's daily life, especially as a vehicle for written communication, as is obvious from her frequent references to letter writing or the arrival of the post. And as an aside, a post horn sounded at the arrival of the horse-drawn mail carriage is found as a watermark in papers intended to be sent by a post. Their appearance in several of Jane Austen's letters brings to mind its clarion call. And I bought some post horn watermarks for you to see. So these papers were intended as writing papers to be sent through the mail. In Jane Austen's writing, one finds descriptions of paper that would be immediately recognized by her contemporaries as being significant. But today, we don't really understand their meaning. For example, in Pride and Prejudice, Jane Beckett receives a letter on, quote, a sheet of elegant little hot pressed paper, indicating not only that it was a woman's stationery, but that its sender was his elevated social and economic status. In Sense and Sensibility, when Mr. Willoughby purportedly kiss and then folds up a lock of Marianne's hair in a piece of white paper, Austin's contemporaries would not have noticed the paper's color as much as its high degree of refinement, which would have been keeping with its precious contents. The term white paper denotes a fine, high quality paper. Brown paper referred to paper made from lesser quality rags that was still white. Henri Balzac, in his Lost Illusions, recounts the travails of David Seychard, the son of an unscrupulous printer who's forced to perfect and sell his secret for making paper out of common weeds. 
Balzac's novel reflects the tremendous crisis brought about by the growing scarcity of rags in 19th century Europe and the desperate attempts to find substitute papermaking fibers, including such unlikely candidates as mummy wrappings and cabbage stumps. <laughs> in the novel, burdened with money difficulties and beset with fears for his beloved wife's health, David absent-mindedly chewed on a stalk of nettles as he was walking homewards. He felt a little pellet sticking between his teeth, and he laid it on his hand and he flattened it out and saw that it was far superior to any of the other plants that he had tried to make paper with. And a few months later, in many clandestine experiments later, he writes, my adored Eve, I am writing to you the first letter on my first sheet of paper made by the new process. The envelope, the letter, and the samples enclosed. I kiss you, we shall have wealth now added to our happiness. Balzac's <coughs> ingenious heroes, hero brings us to the second reason why we rarely encounter accurate, consistent, and meaningful descriptions of paper. Paper is just plain difficult to describe. Upon presenting his paper made from nettles to his skeptical father, Balzac wrote, the old man took up the samples and put his tongue to them. The lifelong habit of the press man who tests his papers this way, he felt it between his thumb and finger. He crumpled it and creased it and he put it through all the trials by which a printer assays the quality of a sample submitted to him. In other words, he used all his senses to get to know the paper. The actions taken by the old printer to evaluate David's paper made from nettles show us that eyesight alone is an inadequate measuring tool of paper's properties. Furthermore, furthermore, nowhere in the novel do we read any adjectives that fully describe its qualities, even from someone like the printer, whose livelihood depended upon accurately identifying its qualities. The difficulty of truly knowing paper by assessing its appearance and structural properties, especially, especially papers coming in from different countries, and the severe economic repercussions of getting it wrong were described by a Monsieur de Fontenelle in 1828. In order to become a connoisseur of paper, de Fontenelle recommends a cognitive exercise involving all five senses. Sight, to determine <coughs> the format or the dimensions. Touch, to determine the weight and the smoothness, hearing to determine the degree of sizing by its rattle or crumpling, smell <coughs> to determine the fiber processing, and finally taste to determine the degree or the kind of sizing. The readers addressed by Monsieur de Fontenelle were people having a vested interest in the characterization of paper. They ranged from paper manufacturers and sellers at one end of the spectrum to mass consumers at the other end, including printers, and book, and newspaper, and magazine publishers. In other words, de Fontenelle's audience is not this audience. Since members of the museum and the library and the academic community, curators, art historians, art even art conservators, even paper conservators, usually do not make paper, we do not intentionally manipulate it or fabricate paper-based products, our physical interaction with paper on a daily basis is minimal. With printed drawings safely ensconced in mats and frames, it's no wonder that we are not more familiar with the attributes of paper. The determination of grain direction, degree of whiteness or absorbency, critical to the creation of a well-functioning book, a luminous watercolor, or a velvety black print, 
is simply not an everyday concern for us, nor are we held accountable if we fail to get it right. So hence, our familiarity with the terminology and the testing used to describe and measure such properties is minimal at best, and therefore, it's not reflected in the literature of art. It's only by becoming fluent in the language of paper, as spoken by the paper industry, paper historians and paper chemists, can we come up with more precise and consistent and thus more meaningful vocabulary <coughs> to be used to evoke the properties of the paper. And I would like to just close by playing you some, how do I get that? Oh. I need to close it. On the right hand, on the top. I can't see it, that's the bottom. Oh. There we go. Where is the screen? Oh. Oh, it's on the screen. A little paper music for your enjoyment. <laughs> properties and optical or appearance properties. Um, and I think it would be very useful for us to develop a, a terminology or a vocabulary based upon the, this, these, these distinctions. And so if, if, you look, if you look at this list, um, I've listed um, the mechanical properties and the um, optical appearance properties um, so that you know what they are. And I can go through some of them that, that I, th I think have um, a real influence on works of art, because after all, is, is, is my area. Um, so, so in terms of the optical appearance properties, I think, I think all of us would agree that color is probably one of the most uh, important or significant uh, properties of, of a paper as used in a work of art. And I would ask you all to just pick up one of your papers and, and let me hear some colors. What do I, I shout out some color. Uh, not white. <laughs> Another color, please. Yellow. Yellow. Blue. 
Blue. Ivory. Ivory. Brown. Brown. Black. 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 All right, there are some blue papers here, some of which may not even look blue. If you, you see that print right in front of you of the pyramid? No. That is actually, can you hold up that paper, please? That's blue paper. Oh, and um, a lot of blue paper doesn't look blue because remember I was talking about the terrible rag crisis in in um, in Europe and, and um, the the quality of rags um, kept getting worse and worse and worse. You know, and um, uh, bleaches were uh, the bleaches that were available at the time were unable to really get the degree of whiteness needed. So blueing was added. Blue a blue. Um, Pigment particles were added, typically small. Um, because as you know, uh, if you add blue into your laundry, your, whiters will, will, your whites will look whiter. So a lot of papers actually have a slight blue tinge to it, um, which even though they're, they're, they're not made as blue papers, they're made as white papers, but they have a blue tinge. There, there is an intentionally blue paper down there um, that, that, that is, is, is intentionally blue. Um, part of the problem with describing uh, paper color by things that they resemble, such as ivory, a buff, or cream, is a problem because in the Western culture, you know, we have Western culture, we know what ivory is, we know what cream is, and we know, does everyone know what buff is? Buff? What is buff? Buff is untanned buffalo skins. Now, I haven't seen any lately. <laughs> um, but if you can imagine, so, so what color is buff? I called every buffalo skin dealer I could think of on the list and begged and please you get some before tanning. And was, it was not possible because of health concerns. Um, but I can only imagine what color buff is. I suspect it's something like this. This is actually very interesting. This is a very early wrapping paper. Um, it's got a very poor formation. Formation refers to the way the pulp is distributed across um, the mold. Um, and it's, it's got very, it has a lot of inclusions in it. In other words, a lot of junk. <laughs> All the leftovers. And as you can imagine, it's very rare to find a historic wrapping paper. Who would have saved the wrapping paper? So this is really a this is really a treasure. Which we pass around. So <laughs> my own wrapping paper. Is that so, so wild? A wild formation. Yes, it's called a wild formation. Um, but uh, to, to get back to to uh, to color, um, cream. We all drink low-fat milk now. <laughs> so cream is even cream isn't as yellow as it used to be. Um, buff, who knows what buff is. Uh, ivory, I don't think we're going to see much more ivory in our lives. Besides, if you've ever seen aged ivory, you know how brown I ivory can get. So it really is not a specific uh, color designation. We can measure color using instrumental analysis. We can give very precise numbers and letters. But we cannot give a name that everybody recognizes as equal to a specific color. We can say things like light yellow, or medium yellow, or dark yellow. But we cannot, uh, beyond that, it's very difficult to come up with a meaningful name that is universally understood. So that is a, another a, 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 an issue that needs to be um, resolved. Um, you probably don't know, and my students who are here will probably be very sick of me talking about this, that, that Munsell invented a color language in the early 20th century. Um, and he meant for this color language to be like musical notation. So just like you could look at a sheet of music and read and hear the music, you would look at this color notation and see the color. The problem is that it was introduced right at the time when color printing became so much better that it was no longer really necessary that you could convey it, you could convey it visually rather than with a, a notation system. 
Um, but, the, but it was so popular at the time that there were even crayons made that were labeled according to Munsell colors, not Munsell language, not red, blue, green, but the, the Munsell. So you would get children used to referring to colors using Munsell language rather than color language. Actually, I, I think it's a great idea. I think we should probably go back to it. But no one's going to learn it anymore. It's kind of like Esperanto. So, <laughs> you know. um, so color, color is, a, is, a, is a problem, um, especially as we get universal um, in our descriptions and also our, our, our data management systems are not going to allow for strange color descriptions. If you want to be able to fully utilize your search and find functions, you know, buff is just not going to cut it. So you're going to have to come up with a system of describing ivory colored paper using agreed upon terms of quantity and color. Um, any, anyone who would like to leave can feel free to leave. The, the other um, uh, visual properties are, are fluorescence. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the marker paper in your packet has optical brighteners in it. Mo this paper has optical brighteners in it. Most papers today have optical brighteners in them because today our eyes, we demand paper that is very white. Um, we have this idea that old paper can be this color, but modern paper has to be white, even brighter than white. And um, the problem with that is um, the dyes that have been added to these papers to make them whiter than white will eventually um, extinguish themselves. And so a, a lot of pop art graphics, a lot of graphics have been made on optically brightened, uh, brightened paper. A lot of printmaking papers um, are optically brightened because this makes colors really you know, pop. Which is, which is a good thing. But um, as these um, optical brighteners, which are the same dye systems that are in Dago paints, as they extinguish themselves, in other words, they can no longer emit to our eyes specific wavelengths of color, um, those um, graphics are going to look a little dead, a little lifeless. That sounds like a, an opportunity for digital imaging to preserve that appearance, but I would imagine there's also limitations for digital preservation of paper. Can you just say a little bit about that? Like what well, your digital pardon? What just what about paper doesn't get recorded when an institution sets out to digitize things on paper? Like what gets lost? Well, mo most of the qualities we just talked about <laughs> get lost. <laughs> you don't hear it anymore. You can't taste it. You can't feel it. The information on it is preserved, and I'm I don't, not saying that's not important. Um, all I'm saying is that there's meaning to the support, and there's there is an experience that one gets in handling paper, and that in the past people would have assumed automatically. Now I'm not suggesting you run to your print study room and start tearing the prints and tasting your prints and everything. But it is a shame to me that um, our um, relationship with paper is so different than it used to be. Um, digitizing collections, I mean, I think it's great, but you can't digitize all fluorescence. You can't digitize, so you can't digitize um, the day glow art because you, you're not digitizing the fluorescent. So when you look at books of Days of art like Peter Haley or Andy Warhol, that's not fluorescent. That's a heavy weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> Fun to think the about. Colors change depending on your monitor. And it's not oh, yeah. 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 What is basically the difference between paper made from tree pulp and that made from rags? Okay. Um, all paper is cellulosic based. Okay? Trees contain cellulose. Cotton contains cellulose. Flax or linen contains cellulose. These are long fiber chains of carbon, 
hydrogen and oxygen. So you have these long chain polymers that are that make up cellulose. Flax or linen has a very high percentage of what is called alpha cellulose. That's good cellulose. Cotton has a high percentage of alpha cellulose. Wood pulp has alpha and beta cellulose in it, and it also has something in it called lignin, which is this, this amorphous cement that binds together all these long chain polymers, because it's its strength. You can, if you just ground up wood pulp, you would end up with paper like this. But today, you can chemically purify and refine wood pulp into pure alpha cellulose. You can make permanent paper out of wood pulp. Because it's, at the end of the day, it's the alpha cellulose content that determines the longevity of the paper. Okay, so wood pulp paper in and of itself doesn't mean impermanent bag. It, you, it, has, it has assumed that meaning, but you can buy museum quality <coughs> rag board, or yeah, I call it rag board, uh, mat board, um, uh, permalife paper um, that, that is made from pure alpha cellulose that is permanent. Okay? And likewise, conversely, you can buy a rag paper that's impermanent. Hmm. So just because it's made from rag, it's just because you, you have to understand what's been done to the source to make the furnish, it's called the furnish of the paper. So, but generally speaking, you're right, wood, wood pulp is, uh, you know, you can mechanically refine it and you can chemically refine it. I, I mm -hmm. have a question about this uh, notion of hot pressed versus cold pressed, and, and I don't know much about the process, so maybe I don't want but if you could just tell me a little bit about those two. Um, processes and what we see in the manufacturer today is all hot press. It's easy to do. <laughs> that that was a finishing process after the paper was formed um, that imparted to it a texture, and um, hot pressed made it quite smooth. Um, cold pressed made it kind of smooth, and not which was the third N O T not meant not pressed at all, and that made it quite rough. And this was, this was um, specifically for uh, papers that were intended to have a function, um, such as uh, watercolored papers, um, or, so, or stationary, hot pressed stationary would mean it had a very fine texture to it, very fine. So it, it was an extra step. So it was more expensive, and it gave it a nice, nice rattle, nice finish. And it's aesthetic. It's not. It doesn't have. Any it's an aesthetic. It's aesthetic. Yeah, pebbled, pebbled. I'm sure you've all seen watercolored on pebbled uh, paper, um, and that's done so that uh, watercolors are transparent. So the light passes through the watercolor, hits the pebbled texture, and is reflected back in all different directions. So it looks it looks brighter. It looks and so that's one reason why artists like watercolor uh, pebble excuse me pebble watercolor paper because it bounces the light back to your eyes in all different directions. Okay. So um, based on what you were mentioning in terms of the development of wove paper, um, so was the first wove paper in the Western world developed in England, and then um, sort of like with the history of photography and the invention of it, were other countries in Europe clamoring to invent their own simultaneously? And then I just wonder in terms of like what people used for letter writing versus art and artistic right. endeavors and printmaking like from that time. And what was, was that in the mid-1700s? It was mid 1750s was um, when uh, Watman Turkey okay. Watman Mill uh, in England, uh, and it was in England, developed this, and it wasn't long before it, it's it spread throughout mm -hmm. Europe. But British 
It was funny, English wove paper was considered the best of the best. Watman specifically was considered the best of the best. Um, in terms of writing paper, um, you know, the, the facts the facts are that wolf paper is smoother for writing with pen and ink. And these were dip pens. Remember, they were dip pens. So you to go in over, I mean, the, the lay paper was very fine. So it wasn't, it wasn't like pebble watercolor paper. But it was considered quite an improvement in paper, the smooth. Now it's ironic because when you buy crane stationery, <coughs> Stationary, you get the fake decalage, you get fake laid chain lines, and you get a fake watermark, yep. and it's ivory colored, right? It's totally fake. <laughs> <laughs> but we have this idea that it's better. And it's not better. I mean, it's, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> but but I mean, if you want really fine old paper, this is really fine old paper. But, I mean, you know, it, that's what, and that's what Crane is, is trying to mimic. But if you look, I mean, there are so many differences. This is antique laid, um, but anyway, I'll get into it. I'll get into my rant. <laughs> but we do have this throwback, mm -hmm. this idea of, of what paper used to look like. Right, and laid papers are still used in some alternative photographic processes too. Sure, but I get, uh, yeah, yeah, they're probably mold made. Uh, I don't know, I don't know which laid papers are used in photographs. Can you say a little bit about the, the distinction between paper and cardboard? It's really a distinction of thickness, and that's a very good question, because one of the most difficult questions, we've been at the Morgan going through a collection and entering it into our data management system, and trying to decide when to call something hard, or cardboard, or thick paper. Cardboard, technically cardboard, is either laminated from several sheets of paper, so you can have 2.4 by 8 by 12 by, or it's what's called filled, which means you have two facing papers with a mass of sawdust basically in between. So you can have filled cardboard or laminated ply cardboard. Um, in the industry, it's a thickness measurement. And off the top of my head, I don't know the thickness. Um, but um, it, it, it card, you know, if you're way back to like early playing cards or something, are laminated papers. And it's, it's odd to think corrugated cardboard is, is modern. Um, Matte board in and of itself is, is fairly modern. They used to use cedar shakes on the back of frames instead of corrugated cardboard, which is, which is interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure in what sense you meant that you're not as familiar with um, what we're removed from paper today. I know about books. You know, obviously less books are going to be printed, etc. But artists still work on paper. and. I was thinking about the omnipresence of paper in our society. It may not be politically correct to use a lot of paper right. towels now, but people still do. Sure. There's garbage bags, there are bags when you go shopping. Sure. Nobody's given up toilet paper yet. Right. Paper's not going anywhere. But what my point is my point is that the variety of paper and the functions of paper I see. have narrowed. Have narrowed. Okay. Yeah. We think of paper today as white, thin, and smooth. Okay. And and we don't we don't we don't use it or interact with it as much as I mean I believe this is my opinion uh, as as people did in the past that they would immediately like that picture of Inigo Jones holding a blank sheet of paper that they would have they would intuit that it wasn't this paper it was a different uh -huh. paper mm -hmm. and they would know that it had a certain surface and it fell a certain way and it had a certain durability. Um, we, we just don't look, look or deal with paper that way anymore. I remember um, maybe I, some people do. <laughs> well, I remember when I worked at the New York Historical Society, there, which had a library that very strong in all sorts of records from New York City and New York State. 
And there was something that they called the bad paper period, where yeah. it was this yeah, paper. <laughs> right, when paper was deteriorating horribly, which meant that a lot of the records were very difficult for a library to maintain Correct. and make accessible to visitors right. who needed the information on them. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, in that case, I think digitization is probably one of your few options. Absolutely. Yeah, so. Um, following that, could you say something about the different absorbency and uh, construction of paper for printing, right, so posting can not be but, you know, maybe in the first, up through and of Jones versus writing paper for mm -hmm. scribal use for calligraphy, for, you know, the, if you're a calligraphy, yeah. uh, a calligrapher, yeah. 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 I mean, are we really talking about two very different substances at that point? Um, Yes, and you needed you needed a far more absorbent paper if you're going to do any sort of Italio engraving or etching. Um, right. You, you couldn't let your letter press. Break your letter press, you really needed. Yeah, I mean, you you needed it to you needed absorbency to a certain extent. Um, was it as soft as printmaking paper is today? I mean, we've kind of fetishized our printmaking papers today. They're very fuzzy and they're very thick. Um, so. It could be that ours are a bit thicker. But if you look at plate paper, mm -hmm. like that Hogarth, yeah. that plate paper is very absorbent. Um, and I think, and it was stronger. It was definitely stronger. Uh, so I, I, I do think there was a difference. In, and you, you did go to a store and you, you bought paper for writing and you bought paper for printing. Um, but I, they were, I think they, they were generally sized. Um, but I don't, I don't know, um, I mean, now, now, if you look at, Rembrandt's papers are still pretty soft. I think it depends on that. Mesotin papers are really soft. And uh, they were so soft that they used to be brushed up before they even went through the press. So they were very soft. Um, <laughs> This may seem like a silly question, but if you keep a newspaper today for a long, long time, mm -hmm. it turns yellow, mm -hmm. and then at a certain point it starts to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. What causes the disintegration of it? What's happening in the newsprint today is about 80% unrefined wood pulp, so you're basically dealing with ground up wood. And it's the lignin that has not been removed, um, turns acidic as it ages, and literally attacks the cellulose around it. So, and as the cellulose ages, it'll turn yellow, and it will become shorter and shorter. Remember I said they were very long chain polymers? They'll start to break up, and they won't become so wavy and strong anymore, and they'll become brittle. So that's what you see. You see the color and the grill pretty much happening simultaneously. Any question? Okay, um, thank you, Professor Ed, very much for this as a talk. A lot of papers for consumption is a really important and really valuable experience to touch and smell and to get those papers. Thank you so much.